you have seen that when we do our printing in C, in C++ language, we use an object, we call it Cout. To that Cout, we insert stuff. Any object that we insert in Cout in return Cout inserts it onto a screen for us. So when I say over here, hello there, hello there is going to get printed on a screen because I inserted it into Cout. Cout is an instance of is an instance of which class? OStream, right? It is an instance of OStream. But OStream class is a class that, like many, like menu item, OStream is fully private. You cannot instantiate OStream. If you try to instantiate OStream, it's going to fail. It won't allow you. Why? Because they had a good logic behind it. I said we had only we have only one console. Having two C outs doesn't make sense. You cannot have two C outs. You cannot say I'm going to print on C out and this C out. You can't. There is only one console. Because there's one console, C out is a unique global instance of O stream. And we have the exact same thing with iStream. So when you include IO stream up there, you actually gain access to the global variable that is instantiated when your program starts running. So C in and C out are always there. Are we OK with that? Any problem with that? And yes. see out is an and instance. And it's an instance of it. Through some magic, it has been instantiated for us. Let's put it this way. Remember menu item and menu that we created? Okay. If your menu, if your menu has a function that returns a menu item, then your menu can instantiate menu item for you. Because, because menu is private, sorry, menu item is private, menu is not. If menu had a function that returned the menu item, then you could re create a reference of menu item and ask menu to create a menu item and give it to you. See how it was created kind of that way. Okay, and it cannot get created again. You cannot create. If you try it, go try try to create C out. Write O stream A. See what happens. It's going to tell you trying to access a deleted object, a deleted function. Okay, so you can't. They don't want you to create it because they want you to only have one C out, not two. They don't want you to be able to have two accesses to the console. It doesn't make sense. It's a unique thing, right? But there is a hierarchy of hierarchy of objects over here that we need to understand. So as I just mentioned, C out is an instance of O stream, right? C in is an instance of I stream. But I stream and O stream, they have children. I F stream is a child of I stream and O F stream is a child of O stream. Why did they create that? Because they wanted you to access files the same way as you access your console. <coughs> so essentially all the things that you learned about C out, O F stream knows too. And all the information that you know from C in, I F stream knows that too. And so, but there is a different difference over here. We can only have one console and one keyboard. You have one keyboard, one console. But if you are dealing with files, you can have thousands of files on a, on a hard drive, right? And you can choose to read from different files. You don't have only one file on the hard drive, correct? So IF stream cannot be like I stream 
like C in that is unique. OF stream cannot be like C out being unique. Therefore, you have to instantiate them. Therefore, they have a constructor. So if I actually, uh, all these things are in a header file called F stream. So if you include F stream, all these things come, uh, are available for you, F stream. Now, if I say I stream, uh, O stream, say my file, okay? If you were to write, if you were to write the constructor of a class that represents a file, what would you pass to that constructor? The? Loud, please. File path, file name, right? <coughs> if you wanted a class to represent a file, what is good to be passed to its constructor is the file name, correct? And that's exactly what they have done. So I say O stream my, fail, my file, let's call it hello.txt. Okay? Now, uh, how many of you, oh, o, o, F stream, sorry, O, F stream, not O stream. See, it actually is giving you an error. See? No instance of constructor, yada, 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 yada. Okay? So O, F stream. All right? So, question. How many of you um, uh, were taught uh, about files in C, in IPC 144? Hands, please, show hands. Okay. So you know a file to be written into, a file to be written into. What do you do? You open the file, right? You read from it, and then you close the file, correct? You open the file. You write into it, then you close the file. No file should remain open. If you remain open, things are going to fall off, and you don't know what's going to happen inside, right? So that's, that's exactly what we need to do. But a question. If you were to write and open a file in C++, and you had an object, you had an object, a class, that represent a file, where is a good place to open the file in a class? What happens first only once? What, when you instantiate, what is invoked? Constructor. So it is a good idea to open the file in the constructor. Because it's impossible to be called twice, right? Like C, C, you can make a mistake. You can open a file twice, and it's going to give you an error. But in here, a constructor, an object is only built once. You cannot build the object again. It doesn't work that way. So because of that fact, it's a good idea to actually open the file in a constructor. And we know that we have to close the file when we are done. Where is a good place to close the file? Destructor. And that's exactly what they have done. So I'm done. I don't need to write any other code. And because OF stream is a child of O stream, it knows everything that C out knows. So all I need to do is say my file. And that's it. Ny file. No, not ny, my, ny file, my file. And that's it. Because C out knows how to write on a screen, it writes the exact same way in a file. If I run this beautiful program of mine, Three years later, when it compiles, four years later, five years, there we go. The output is nothing, because I didn't print on a screen. I printed in a file, right? So I have to see where is the file. Where is the file? I didn't sp specify what is the, what of the file? Path of the file. Because I didn't specify what is the path, the current place where it's executed, that's the path, right? So I'm just going to open this, and hopefully over there I'm going to have a hello.txt. And if I open hello.txt, I'm going to have hello there in there. Ta-da! I just wrote in a file. Are we okay with this? Questions on this? Suggestions? All right. 
now that we have that, let's expand it a little. So I'm going to say, uh, let's save that one too. 010stream.cpp. Close the exception. For some reason, it keeps giving me exception. I don't know why. Now, let's create a string, character string, 80 characters. All right? And I'm going to say, instead of O stream, I'm going to have now an IF stream, hello.txt. What C in does? C in reads, right? So IF stream reads from where? Hello.txt. Therefore, I should be able to do What do I do? str, and I'm going to say c out, str, and l. And then split the screen so we can look at the text we are reading. What is the output of the following program? What is it going to print? Hello pass? I don't think it's going to be hello pass. What is it going to print? Mm, the first string that it finds in the file. Which is? Uh, hello there. Hello there. Do you think hello there is going to get passed? Printed? So what, Val? If not that. OK, so now I want you to imagine this. You have, I want you to ar actually use your knowledge of inheritance. IF stream is C in. If you had a C in command running, and a guy sitting over there entered hello space there exclamation mark, hit the enter, what would go into SDR? Hello, right? Because space is a delimiter. Remember, it's nothing new. It is exactly C in, and it's going to work exactly like C in. So essentially, if I run this, it's as if somebody typed hello and space there left is left in a keyboard buffer. So if I actually run this twice, if I read this twice, and run it again, what I would have will be hello there. The first one picks up hello, second one picks up there because it reaches the new line, backslash n, correct? It is exactly like receiving it from keyboard, but even better. Why? Because you don't have to deal with that dumb, stupid user behind the keyboard. You don't have to keep saying, oh, I asked you to enter this much, you entered too much. Now you did it this one, I asked. So you, can, you don't need to validate like that. The only validation that you need to do is to see if the data that is coming in is correct, is within acceptable parameters. And if C in, which is in this case is my file, I stream, were successful, it didn't fail. If it fails or the data is not good, the only thing that you need to do, stop the program, print the message, data file is corrupted, fix it. Done. There is no interaction with user. Another good thing about it is that before you actually read from the file, you can open the file and see what's the format of the file. And foresee what you are going to write. And what you are going to write is going to get the things exactly as what you want line by line with absolutely no problem. There is no need if we want to stick to text file reading and writing, there is no need to teach anything because every single thing that you worked with works still exactly the same way with absolutely no difference. The only difference is that before the data comes in, you can actually see it and write the proper commands to actually read things properly. Are we okay with this? Are we okay? Are we okay? All right. So let's go a little uh, more uh, in depth. So okay. 
Now, let's say I have a file. Add new item. It's going to be a resource, no, utility, and it's going to be a text file. And I'm going to call it data.txt. OK? And let's say this data.txt of mine holds some phone records. So I have 416, 555, 1678. OK? And this belongs to a person called. What should I call it? Homer Simpson. Right? And then we have another. I didn't know he lives in Toronto, but hey. Um, another one, 416 or 647. 647, right? 647 dash 555 1234. Okay? And that belongs to Darth Vader. Okay? So, we have these guys sitting over there, and we want to read the records for these, okay? First of all, now I want to actually do good programming. If I want to have something like this, and I want to read these things, hopefully for that, I have a, some kind of a structure created. So I have a structure, I have an area number, area, area code for the, for the number, I have the number and I have the name. It's a phone record that I'm reading, right? Any problem with that? And that phone record of mine, I created a, a, a default constructor to set things to, uh, to null for me. OK? And uh, also, uh, I'm going to uh, overload the. Uh, um, I, I'm going to write a function to display it when it's needed, OK? So that'll be my class, a very simple, fully public. I don't want to, I'm not doing anything object oriented. I just want to show you how things work, that's all, all right? So I want to get those information inside this structure, OK? As simple as that. To do that, if I want to actually do that, I need to write a function that reads Phone records, right? And it has to tell me that it's actually successful or not. So I'm going to say Boolean. Then I'm going to say read phone number or phone record, OK? And I'm going to have a phone record. Reference, let's call it phone record, DR. And I am reading it from a file, right? I know that I have to open a file, so I'll do that. And a file that I'm reading is an IF stream reference uh, I stream, whatever you call it, or let's call it file. That's easier. Now, so essentially, this is how it's going to happen. I'm going to have my main. So I'm going to have my main written exactly as I have done before. So that's going to be my name, my main. But the difference would be that I'm going to open data.txt as if stream. Are we OK with that? So I have this. I don't know what's that character string doing over there. So I have a phone record, and I have a file open. So I want to be able to say read phone record. Then over here, I put R for the phone record, and I'm going to say my file. That's the file that it's going to read because it's open and ready, right? Because, because I'm a bad person and I don't know how to do object-oriented programming. We'll do, we'll get there. I'm going to bring it in. Don't worry. Baby steps. OK? That's, that, seriously, that was the reason. I'm trying to first go this way, then bring it in, and then make sense of it why. OK? So let's do it. All right? But good question. Anyways, so in here, what in this function, what represents the file? It's the variable file, correct? File for me is like C in, correct? So if I wanted to read the first thing inside area, what do I do? If it was C in, I would have sent C in, and like that, I would say PR dot area, correct? 
but I don't have CN, I have file. So instead of CN, I'm going to say file. Same thing. So 416 is red. Now I have one character over here. What do I do with that character? If it was CN, what, would you, what, you, what you would have done? When you read the, da the date, when you read the first thing for year, then what did you do with that separator? You ignored it. Why don't you say it loud? You say, no, don't worry, people listen to you. Okay, all right, so what's going to be? It's ignore. I simply say, hey, Mr. File, ignore one file, please. So one, ignore one character. One character is ignored, that dash is passed. Now that the dash is passed, I am standing right in front of 555. So now I can say file, read into pr.number. Oh, num number. Again, I ignore one character. Now I want to read that Homer Simpson or Darth Vader right up to backslash n. What do I do? What, which function I call with C in to do that? Silent people. Get line. There you go. Actually, get line came from here. It is actually getting a line. So what happens over here, I'm going to say file dot get line into pr.name, up to 80 characters, and stop at backslash n. Right? And then I'll check. If file, I need to return a Boolean, right? Result is true. No, it's false. If not file. Or file.failure. File.fail, whichever you like. OK? Result is equal to false. So I'll be optimistic in here, which means I'm going to have a Boolean over here. So I'm going to say bool result is true. Two, two seconds. Then I'm going to say file.clear. And at the end, I'm going to say return result to see if I read it properly or not. Yes. You had the question? OK. So now that I have those things, and I, oh, actually, I have this one. Let me overload uh, C out with that. So I'm going to say O stream operator. If in final exam, one person cannot do this, overload for C out, really, I'm going to get mad at them, seriously. You know how many times I've been doing this? And it's the exact same signature for all of them? The exact same signature. Please, don't make a mistake here. Operator, O stream, reference, OS, and uh, we have constant uh, phone record, reference phone record, and we simply say return P dot display, right? And I pass OS to it. Are we okay with this? Are we okay? Now, let's see what happens. If I run the program, I'll show you what happens, then I'm going to walk through it. Actually, nothing happened. Do you know why nothing happened? Can anybody tell me? Because I didn't print the damn thing. I read it, but I didn't print it. C out, R, and L. That's better. Control F5. And three years later, is there anything wrong with what I, what I just wrote over there? Everything's good? I have a space in front of Homer. I'm not supposed to. Get line doesn't skip the spaces. OK? So I have two choices. Either I have to ignore two characters or stop programming and open a ticket with people who provided the data file for me. And I say, if this is supposed to be comma separated, you're not supposed to have a space in front of it. OK? Fix your file. So either they're going to fix their file or I'm going to do my programming. In our case, I'm going to fix the file. <laughs> OK? Which means if it's comma separated, it's supposed to be comma separated, which means this is gone. Now, if I run it, 
I will actually have Homer Simpson. Right? And let's add one more. 905, 555, 4321. What do I do? Give me a name. Uh, mm, Mickey, Mickey Mouse. Is that how you write Mickey? No, I-E? There's no C? Is it like this? No. <laughs> so, so that's the one, Mickey? OK, sorry. You, um, I, it's EFL. English is fourth language. <laughs> sorry. I, uh, but anyways, so, so anyways. So now what I can do over here is this. Now I can simply say, now I can simply say, while you can read print and read the whole file. It's going to keep reading until it hits the wall. So if I go like this, so it's going to go one by one, ta, 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 read, and I'm going to have everything printed down from the file. So as you see, there is nothing special about this. It's actually much easier than dealing with users. OK? You can see what the file is. You can program for the file, and da, da, you see that happen. Are we OK with this? Are we OK? One, two, all right. So let's save this. Zero, three. This is ice stream. CP. Uh huh. How does it know? When you say that's behavior of C out. We, go, we, we learned at the beginning of the semester, when, sorry, C in. When C in reads a number, if, it's, if the first thing is a digit that is convertible to a number, number, it feels good. It keeps reading until it can't. When it's finished, it takes the whole thing and converts it to an integer. So it starts. It says 4, I'm good. 1, I'm good. 6, I'm good. Oh, I don't know what is that. Stop. 416 is 416. I'm going to get it as an integer. If I had a dash at the beginning, it would have failed. Because it says, read an integer, no integer. I can't do it. I'm shy, and I'm going to just not work with you anymore. So it fails right out of the bat. So just to show you what I mean by that, I'm going to do this. Right? Save it. Run it. <laughs> It actually, I'll, I'll tell you what happened. It's a good thing. Let's walk through it to see what happened. OK. Let's walk through it. You know what happened? Huh? No, 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 no. Can anybody tell me what happened? I, did, I just did the stupidest thing in my entire life. I gave such a bad example. Can any, what happened? That dash is a minus. It's still an integer. So it actually read minus one. <laughs> so yeah, if I, you cannot have a dash after. So it stops at a dash. Dash after doesn't mean anything. Dash before means so. So if I put over here, I don't know, uh, uh, something like that. Anything that cannot be integer, then, then it's going to be only that. It's not going to read anything else. OK? <laughs> that was such a stupid example. Pardon me? Is that what? Yes. Because I said I'm stupid. Yeah, yeah. Stupid is stupid does. All right, so <laughs> are we OK? All right. I have no worries on that. It's, there is, it's no secret to anyone, my dear. All right, so.
they say to err to err is human right to err is human to really mess things up you need to be a programmer yeah anyways <laughs> all right all right anyways uh, so now the next step so all the reading thingy that I have done in this phone record thingy, I'm going to just throw it away and go back to my knowledge of writing uh, member functions that you were worried about. So instead of actually writing a uh, thing like that, I'm going to actually write a member function that reads using IS. So as if I want to read from keyboard, and that's iStream, please. Uh, Note that, it's not IF stream. And I'm going to say, OK, exactly as if you have, as you have done before, read everything line by line. The only difference is that I'm not going to error check here. Why? Because if it fails, the object remains in a fails mode. They can find out what's going on. And then I'm going to overload that one exactly as if I want to read from the screen, uh, from the uh, keyboard. So I'm going to say iStream operator uh, extraction, and then I'm going to say iStream IS phone record, yada, yada, yada. Anybody have any problem with that? Now, this is the place that magic happens. That is... I'm going to do this. My file, sorry. So when I say my file and I extract an R out of my file, what operator will be called? At left side, I have IF stream. At right side, I have phone, correct? Have I overloaded that? Have I overloaded that? Do you see an overload with an IF stream? Exactly. What happens over here, this is where virtuality actually comes to play. So what happens, it says, my file is IF stream. There is none. But wait a minute. Its mother is overloaded. And you can always refer to a child as their mother. Therefore, IS, my file will come over here, and IS becomes a reference of my file. And when you say read or ignore, because all those methods are virtual, the latest version of them will be called. The latest version over here deals with the file. All the methods that IF stream is using and got it from iStream, they're all virtual. Therefore, anything you have done with that one, you don't even need to overload anything new anymore. You overload it for CN, and it works with I for file. Why? Because everything is virtual, and the latest version will be called. That is why I told you at the beginning of the semester. Remember what I told you? I said, any time you are writing a read or a display, take this advice and pass iStream and OStream through it. Remember what I told you? Any time you are printing something, pass an iStream to it, initialize it to see, it, see out or see in. Why? If you didn't do that, if I actually, instead of doing this, if instead of this, I had C in, if I had something like this, it wouldn't have worked. Because, let me show you what happens. If I actually have C in over here like this, If I had something like this, there is no error. 
When I call it, what's going to happen? Where is it? What was the error? Ah. Oh, I have. Oh, I, I, ch I, I removed the wrong one. That's OS. This is the one that I wanted to remove. One more time. See what happened? It's waiting for me to enter it from the keyboard. Because now it's not the latest version that is called. I limited my function to only work for CN and not with the hierarchy. Now I actually have to enter over here, whatever, and comma, whatever. Hit enter. There you go. That's the one. Every single time I have to enter, it receives it. I have to enter, it receives it. And control Z means end of file, so it stops. <laughs> All right? So that's why. That's why I always told you whenever you are creating a function that is involved with, C, with reading and writing, make sure that you pass the object of iStream through it so it's upgradable. If you didn't do that, it wouldn't have been upgradable. And now it is. All of them. All the IOs in iStream, they are virtual. So therefore, the file automatically updates everything when you're acting. So that's, that's one of the most beautiful things about it. And this is true polymorphism. What you just saw, this is what we call polymorphism. Doing the same thing in a different, it has many shapes. I wrote, I wrote, I created the file. I didn't even implement anything for the file in my class. And it brought, works perfectly with the file. Why? Because it's a polymorph thing. Are we okay? All right. So, with files, there are many other things that are here that it's good to, for you to know. For example, if I actually had fstream over here, it would have still worked. So if I said fstream over here, not ifstream, if I did fstream my file, and I ran this program, it would still work. Why? Because fstream is a child of iStream and ostream together. Okay, that's multiple inheritance. Multiple inheritance you'll see next semester. It's one of the features of C++. In C++, like Java and all those things, it's linear. You can have only one parent. You can just, because like a chain, you come down. In C++, you can actually have two classes and inherit two classes into one, and you keep going. It actually builds chaos, but in these cases, it just makes sense. And there is a third element there's a second element, there's a second argument for the constructor of a file, iStream or OStream or whatever. These values are separated with a bar. You can actually modify and say how to open it. Open a file to write. Open a file to append. So anything you write will go at the end of the file. Open a file and truncate. Wipe out the file and then begin to write. All these things are second element, and they are all defined in the grandparent, iOS. Okay? So if I wanted to, like, I can say over here, iOS, out. Actually, in. If I would say out, then it would be bad. Okay? If I wanted to be read and write, you put a bar between. Okay? That means open for read and write. So you say how to open. That bar you will learn in OP345 is called uh, a binary OR, which essentially means it ORs individual bits of an integer. You, you don't care about it. Don't worry about it. We'll come to it the next semester. So essentially, you separate them by bar, and it applies them both at the same time. OK? What are those things? Those are all here. By the way, it's mentioning over here that it's optional. It is not. OK? So you're going to see over here it says, three years later, come on, you can do it. Where is it? Manipulators, for example. It says optional. It is optional, but please go through it. They're very good. 
they are very much easier way to format your uh, your uh, file, your uh, information, uh, your text output. Manipulators are very nice. Take a look at them. Um, uh, don't forget about that state. We don't know. Robots, yada yada yada. There you go. File stream classes optional. It's not optional. You need to know it. Okay. And this is what I was talking about. You see that? I stream, I stream, iOS, I stream, O stream, I O stream is the child, and F stream is the child of that one. And that's why F stream knows everything that O stream and I stream knows. Okay. And these are the mood modes that you can open it. It's all over here. It says good to know, which is really good to know. There you go. iOS in, open for reading, out, open for writing, app, open for appending, trunk. When you open, it nullifies the, the file. The, it empties the file. So if you have a file that you want it to be temporary and you want it to wipe out and start fresh, that's trunk for you. OK? ATE, it opens at end. The difference between AT and append, and append is that when you open as append, there is no way to write anywhere other than the end of the file. With ATE, initially you are writing at the end of the file, but then you can come and edit the file halfway through, change things in a file if you want. Doesn't apply to you at all, but it's good to know. And the combination, like if you want to open for reading and writing, that's the one. If you want to open for reading and overwriting, you have to put a trunk at the end, so it's the same thing, but trunk at the end. Open for appending, in and out and append. Open for overwriting, in, out, and uh, out and trunk. If you want to open for reading and adding at the end, then it becomes in, out, and ATE. So all these things, you put them together, and uh, uh, these, like, as a, as a whole, you put this one as a second argument of your constructor, and that's how, to, how, how, is, how is it going to work. Now, do it as common sense. If you instantiate IF stream, iOS out is just the, uh, it's the, the class is for reading. You cannot make it output, okay? So F stream can take in and out, but I stream only gets the input ones, and O stream only gets the output ones, and nothing but that. Um, and that's it. This, the exclamation mark, the not operator is overloaded with C in and C out. You know that from the beginning. And Boolean cast is overloaded. So that's a, um, uh, nothing new about it. Um, although, um, although uh, they have open statements in, they have open statements in, uh, in, uh, constructor and, and, and closed statement in destructor, but those methods exist. I can literally say over here, my file dot close, then say my file dot open, and open hello.txt. I can do that. There is no problem with it. Hello.txt, and then Oh, I have to clear before this because it uh, it's it fails and it comes over here. So my file dot clear, then close, then open for hello, and now I can have character str eighty one. And go uh, my file str and see out str. OK, so you can manually close and on. And the opens arguments are exactly like uh, 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 arguments of the other one. So you can say open, and then you put over here iOS in. OK, and close closes it. So you have, a, and there are many other different functions that you can have in files that I'm not going to go through now. OK, binary read and write and things like that, but we're going to, you're going to, yeah. Learn it somewhere else. Um, that's it. That's all about files. You don't need to know anything else. Okay? Let's go for a break, come back, and uh, 
We are going to talk about templates when we come back. Please remind me to unpause. If for some unknown reason I wanted to not use the, pl the, the uh, plus operator and I wanted to add two numbers and return the result through a function, this would have been uh, my choice. If I wanted to actually <sighs> copy few, uh, uh, what should we call it? Um, add two numbers, because I know overloading will happen in uh, C++, if I have an integer, few integer variables, double variable, and I say add a, b, because the two uh, arguments are integer, it will pick the proper one and call the proper one. Remember, that's, what do we call this? What did I do with these functions? These functions are loud. These functions are overloaded. Override is an inheritance. An override is an identical function that overrides the child's. That's overriding a function. Overload is when two functions have uh, same name and different signatures. Are we okay with this? Are we okay? All right, reboot yourselves, please. Reboot. Your project is going to work. Reboot, reboot yourself, please, okay? All right, like if you don't know this is overloading, we are in big trouble, okay? Overloading, okay, so overloading. So, and that works for any type of object that I have. Even if I have a class, and the class has the specifications of that function, so I have a class called container that implements the plus operator and can be displayed using uh, C in and C out, what I can do is simply use the exact same notation for it to Sorry, I'm opening up my cheat sheet over here. Where did I put it? I put it right here. Yeah, I can, I can actually have a function like that called for the container. Of course, I need that K thingy over there. So I need to have... Um, container i set to 20, j set to 30, and k. So if I have something like that, then I can actually write the exact same function for the container to do the exact same thing. These are all from the beginning of the semester. I'm not teaching anything new. We're okay with that, right? So if I run this program, it will work for all three of them. And as a result, I'm going to have 35.5 and C dot value is 50. OK? And these are the behavior of integer, double, and a container being added to each other and being displayed or whatever. Are we OK with this? Are we OK with this? Now, what is common between these three functions? Can anybody tell me? If I ask you what is common between these three functions, what would you say? Same what? Same identifier name and? They all return the same way and? Same number of arguments, but the most important thing. They all do the same thing. They all, they are all same logic, but for different types. Are we okay with this? So, like, literally, seriously, just imagine, instead of doing this, I could actually call somebody and say, okay, I have a function, and I'm going to say over here type, okay? I'm just going to say type, type, and type. I can ask any of you students over here, say, please look at the function over here, see if it's being called here, use this template, 
and replace the type with the type that you see. So if it's an integer, replace the type with an int. It becomes int add int x int y, right? If it's a double, it becomes double add double x double y. If it's, where's the other one? Container, it becomes container add container x container y, right? C++ actually does that for you. You can actually tell to C++ to write the code for you. How do you do that? You say, this function is a template, literally. And the type name over here, I'm going to call it type. Now, that type could be type T, X, W, any placeholder. And you are telling to the compiler, and you are telling to the compiler, look anywhere you see the function being called, see what is the signature, write the binary code for me and add it to the, write the function for me and add it to the binary code. So C++ literally writes the function for you at compile time. Therefore, if I did not have any function calls, nothing would have been written, right? Because it's not ever used. Are we okay with this? This is called a template, yes. That's exactly what I want to say. So, when we write a function, what do we do? We put the prototype in a header file, and we put the CPP, the, the logic for it in a CPP file, right? That's how we create a module, correct? But please recall this. When we compiled, at the beginning of the semester, I showed you that. When we compile a code, the header files that are included in a CPP file, and CP file, CPP file by itself, get compiled separately from other CPP files. And the binary code, all, all of them, after the compilation is put together using the linker. Remember that? So when the compiler is compiling the first one, and if you have the template's header, the prototype, inside a header file, compiler doesn't have enough information to write the function for you because the body is in another CPP file, correct? Because of this fact, unlike other functions, a module for templates consists of only a header file. And everything, the header, the body, everything goes into the header file. Why? Because the compiler needs the whole thing to be able to rewrite the code for you. Otherwise, it won't. So every single time you are creating a template, everything must be in a header file. If I had an add.h and add.cpp, this was wrong. You can only have one add.h and have the whole function in there. So the compiler knows how to create it for you. Are we okay with this? Pardon me? Show you an show you an, I'll, I'll show it to you, the next one. So as long as we understand it, I'll, I'll come to the example. Okay. So <clears throat> let's run this. Just make, make sure it's, it, it doesn't have any syntax error anyway. So there we go. It, it actually runs, and it creates all the three functions for you. So as you see, there are no add functions, only one template, and the, the C++ compiler is creating the, generating the code for you. So that's 0, 05, template CPP. Whoa, CPP, CPPP. Wow, long gone, no more. Anyways, if you don't know that joke, it means you don't know what CPPP is. Anyways, uh, say, Give me a second. <clears throat> remember in IPC 144, remember in IPC 144, we did something and we called it bubble sort. Remember that? Remember bubble sort? That's bubble sort, OK? What is this bubble sort designed to do so? To do? 
to sort an array of what? Bob? <laughs> I'm too tired to be serious on that joke. <laughs> it's object oriented. Yeah, it is a pub. Yeah. So bubble sort sorts bubbles. <laughs> so this is sorting doubles, which sounds like bubbles, but it's just instead of a dub, bubble, it's a double. OK, so it's actually sorting doubles, right? I don't want it to sort doubles only. <laughs> I want it to sort anything. I want it, I want it to sort anything for me. So I'm going to convert. First of all, I'm going to remove the name. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to have it <laughs> double sort anymore. I'm going to make it just sort, OK? So I have two functions over here that accomplishes this task. Let's do the first one, the top one first. So what I do first, I'm going to say template, right? Ooh, template, right? Then I'm going to say type name. Let's put T over here, for example. Now, what needs to get changed to T over here for that swap to work? Doubles, right? Void remains void. I don't change that. So it becomes T, T. T, correct? Right? So when compiler sees swap is being used, it looks at the signature and rewrites swap for me as needed. Are we okay with this? Now, my question is that when it creates the thing, what type of a type, <laughs> what kind of a type I can use with that swap, I can positively use with that swap with it not failing? OK. It was like the project. It was very vague. Yeah. So I'm saying is that for that swap function to work, for that swap function to, to work, for this swap function to work, what specifications the object T should have? What capabilities the object T should have? No. It could be a car. Actually, I'm going to bring a car for you exactly just because you said that I'm going to sort cars with this. Line number six, what do you see over there? T temp equal another temp. No? No? You see type A is equal to B, and A and B, employee A is equal to B, and B is an employee too. What does empl what employee needs to have for that statement to work? Copy constructor. It's being copied. Look at line five. Temp is being copied out of another T, correct? So you have to document and let people who are using your template to know their type must support copying. Otherwise, my swap won't work. What other thing it needs to have? Assignment operator, because I have target of A is equal to target of B. So swap for swap to work is copy constructor and assignment operator. That's one of the questions in final exam. OK, I'm just going to actually, not, not that particular, maybe in a quiz, but no. OK, so anyways, since, since I remember in, in OP244's final exam, there was always a question about templates. So there's no mystery that we have questions about templates. <clears throat> now let's do the sort. Let's make a sort a little fancier than this. Ah, I'll do it later. Anyways, so template, so template, type name, type. It doesn't have to be the same. And there is something else that I have to tell you about template. The template tag only affects the scope that is coming after. That scope can be a scope with open bracket, curly bracket, close curly bracket, 
or just a single statement. When you are writing template, it only affects the next scope. Sort is a new scope, so it needs a tag of its own. And what needs to get changed to type over there? First thing is double, right? So that needs to change to type. Do I need to change integer to type? Do I need to change int to type? No, I'm sorting. Five cars, five soaps, five lamps, five integers. Number is number, it doesn't matter what. So that doesn't change. Use your logic. If I give you a function and I tell you change this to a template, change only things that are dependent to your template, not everything. Doesn't need that. Okay? For this thing to work, what specifications my object should have, type should have? Analyze it. For the sort, the exact same question I had for the previous one that it was copy constructor. I am asking that question here. What should type have for, what capabilities type should have for my sort function to be able to work? These are questions that I'm going to ask in the final exam. I'll give you something and I'll tell you, tell me the specific, the, tell me the, cap the capabilities, tell me the features that the type needs to have for this logic to work. What do you see? Pardon me? Greater than operator, yes. Greater than operator must be functional between two types. Otherwise, it won't work. If it's two cars, one car being greater than the other car should have a meaning, whatever the thing is, all right? And that's the sort. So this is now converted to a template. If I want to use this somewhere, I have to put it in a header file. And I will put it in a header file. So I'm going to actually put a kind of fancier one over here. So it's the exact same thing. So we are going to create a header file, add new item, sort.h. That's the example you wanted, my friend. So you create a header file, sort.h. You put all the good stuff that you put for a header file. So if not defined, stds, sort h, define, exact same thing. And, and if. And then you put the logic that you wanted in there. Now this sort that I have is a little fancier than the other one, but it's essentially the same thing. It's, the, it's a bubble sort. The difference is that you can check it to be ascending or descending. I just put an if statement in a swap, so if it's ascending, I'm going to check for greater than. If it's descending, I'm going to check for less than. Very simple. So the other sort was this. I just added this. Woo! I just added a second section for it, so it sorts both ways. You can sort it ascending or descending. So the comparison, but it doesn't matter. Anyways, again, it's the exact same thing, no difference. So I'll save that. So this is my sort header file. Now, as you see, everything is in here. If I want to sort something, I'm going to use this as a header file. So. Using that sort, I have a class called car. My car class has all these good stuff over here, but it also has less than, greater than, equal, everything set up for it. You can display a car, you can read a car. I have a student, student has student number, and student is actually less than and greater than with the student name. 
So it actually, depending on the student name, you come first and next. I have an employee, and less than and greater than for an employee is checked with, with, with their name too. Now I have an array of car, student, employee, and integer. And I sort all four of them with the exact same logic. And all because they are all, uh, they don't have any resources. There is no need for copy constructor. They all work. And I run this. It uses the exact same sort algorithm that I have to run. And as a result, everything's going to be sorted properly based on whatever their less than or greater than is doing. So the cars are being sorted on their license plate. Uh, the names for employees are in reverse order based on their first name. And uh, students are based on their uh, first name, but in ascending. And integers are sorted like that. So as you see, they are all sorted in their own way just using that. It's kind of magic, OK? All you need to know is that every single class has the operator. Remember I told you for this sort, for this sort to work, what do we need to have? For the sort to work, what our objects need to uh, have to be able to work? To be able to copy and set to another one, and to be able to have less than or greater than. And every single class that I have over there, the car, the student, all those things, because they are all uh, classes without any resource, they can simply get copied, shallow copy. They can all get shallow copy, not deep copy. And they just go through uh, so they don't need any copy constructor or assignment operators. The only thing that is iffy about them is the greater than and less than operator, which are actually implemented. So it's all good to go. I can use them and sort them using my, uh, my uh, template. Now, what I want you to do when you go home, actually run this and step by step go through it. Press F10, F11, go through it step by step and see how all the sortings are happening. All right? As simple as that. There is nothing extraordinary about it. Take a look. I have five cars. And one by one, the cars are set. No, I'm saying sort five cars. I have six students. I'm saying sort six students. I have six employees. I'm saying sort six employees. I have 10 integers. I'm saying source, sort six integers. Uh, sorry, 10 integers. And it just goes through them. Walk through it, and you'll see how it works. Questions down to here? Mm -hmm. The only advantage? The only advantage, the most important advantage of templates is that you write the logic once and it gets applied to as many things as you want. You don't have to rewrite the function. With overloading, you have to rewrite the function for every single object. If you have five different objects, you need five functions with same name and different arguments, correct? With template, you write one function, and the compiler will do the re rewriting for you. I don't. I have over here five different objects, four, di four different objects, and only one sort function. Right? That's the one. Questions? Suggestions? Objections? If your brains are completely fried, I'm not going to go through the classes. You can watch the video. The other class, I went through it. It's late, Friday. And I don't want to tell you the classes, and then you get confused. Because this, the classes, the class templates won't come in exam. That's for next semester. But this will be on exam. And your workshop nine. So. You want me to talk about class templates? OK, one person said yes. Anybody else wants to? So those who don't want to listen to it, you can just leave. That's OK. It's done. OK? Those who want to listen, stay.
All right. So where did they put it? Ah, oh, there you go. Let's put this as uh, zero six template. Container, that container thingy that we have written, where is it? Let me bring it. That's a good example to start with, actually. Where is it? Where did I put it? Where did I put the container? It was the f first one? Yeah. So I have a container that can contain one integer. Why did I write that? I don't know. I have a function with a container that keeps one integer, right? For whatever reason. Now I want this container to be able to keep any object, not only one integer. How can I do that? It's the exact same way as a function template. So I can make a class a template. So what do I do? I write template, type name, T, and because this is fully, actually I have another one over here, so I need two of them, and template, type name, T. I haven't implemented it yet, but I want to just first bring up an issue. In here, say I would say container, X. Let's say that my implementation is done and correct and everything. How can you say from line, line 32? How is it possible for you to say from, from line 32, what type of a container is this? I am changing my container. My container was supposed to hold one integer, correct? Now I'm changing it so it can hold anything. From line 32, how can I say what type of container is this? Is it an integer container, employee container, car container, milk container? It's impossible. Why? Because classes don't have type, they don't have uh, signature. Functions have signature. From a signature of a function, you can identify how to create a function. From a class, you can't. That's why Class templates are created and instantiated differently. You have to put the signature inside your creation. So when you are actually creating and instantiating a class, you have to tell the compiler which one. So if I want this thing to be a double container, I have to say container double. That's the difference between a class template and a regular class. Class templates, they always carry the signature of what you want to create. And because of that fact, when you are converting a class to a template, you have to make sure that every single name of the container, of your class, carries the signature so the compiler knows which one you're talking about. With ex with three exceptions. So let's do the container thingy. Now, first the obvious ones. I want to change my container. I want to change my container to keep anything, right? So this int should change to a t, right? My constructor is getting a value, correct? And that value 
should be t, correct? I cannot have equal to 0 anymore because that means the type of mine should have a constructor that accepts an integer. It's not going to work out. So that has to be removed. And instead, I have to create a default constructor container and don't do anything in it, hoping that their type has a default constructor. OK? That becomes my first thing. If you are using my container, your type must have a default constructor. Then I return the value, so t should be there. And because it's returning t, it must be copyable. Passing by value needs copy constructor. I am setting the value, so that's a t, another copy constructor, and an assignment operator. plus between the two, so in here I am returning a t, <clears throat> and plus should work between the two. And now, back to what I said. Every single thing that I have in here must carry the signature of the template. Every single class name must carry the signature of template with three exceptions. First. The class name that comes immediately after template, that will not carry the signature. The name of constructors, they don't carry the signature. And if there is a destructor, that won't carry the signature either. So just for the heck of it, I'm going to create a, a destructor. So virtual destructor for container. That will not carry the signature either. Everything else will. So in here, I have a container reference. It needs to know what type of a reference it has to create. It has to be a T container. In here, it's, calling, it's creating a nameless container. What type of container it needs to be? It needs to be a T. <clears throat> in the O stream, a reference, constant reference of the com container is passed. Which one is passed? And now we have a template, a container template. That can be used for anything. A double container, an integer container, for anything you want, you can use this. Are we okay with this? So now I can actually say x 10.4 and have a container, oh, so, so, sorry, 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 x point, this value, point value, and then I can say container, int, y, and I can say y dot value, 20, now I can say c out, x, and a space, and y. And when I run this, because I specifically mentioned what is what, it's going to have a double container and an integer com container. So now I have a class that the logic can be used for any type. Pardon me? All right. That was the easy one. Now let me show you a complicated one. OK? So I'm going to put 08, class template. I don't need that sort. Now, <clears throat> say I want to create An array of integers. OK? A dynamic array of integers. So I don't have to worry about the length of an array. And I want the array to automatically resize itself. So this is my array. 
Okay? As simple as it can get. I can create it so essentially if I have a main, I can use my main like this. Not like that, but like this. Give me a second. So I can use my array like this. <clears throat> I can say int i, not oh, 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 bad boy I am, bad boy I am. There you go. So I can say int i5. Oh, see out, I need uh, io3. Include IO stream and using namespace STD. Now, <clears throat> I haven't I haven't shown you that the body of the, the the class. I'll show it to you, but let's let's first get get over this and see how does it work. So, I have an integer array i five. So it dynamically creates i integers for me and hold it over here and keeps the five in, in size. I can go through the array one by one. I can even exceed the size of the array. So as soon as the operator index passes the size 5, automatically resizes the array to a new size. You remember how resizing was. I show it to you. You create a new integer. You copy everything. You delete the old one. Yada, yada, everything happens beside, behind the scene. So my integer array is a fully dynamic integer array that I don't need to worry about anymore that I'm going to exceed the size of it and it's going to crash on me or anything like that. How I coded all this thing? I coded it like this. Where is it? So this is the body for the integer array. Very actually simple and straightforward. It's not, there's no magic in here. If you've we've already done this, you know that 55,000 times. So integer array size, I initialize the size. If the size is one, zero, I'll make it one. Then I'm going to say it's new size. So I initialize, uh, I allocate, and I leave garbage in it. <clears throat> to return the size, I do that. To resize, I get the new size. I allocate the new size. I copy one by one everything from the, the, the old one into the new one. Delete the old one. Update the, the size. Update the, the address. Update the array. And I have update the size, and I have the, the new thing, uh, the new size. At is the function version of operator index. So I'm saying at this index, it returns a reference of, an ele of that element. So I simply say, if the index that you are sending is greater than the size, resize, and then send the index. So if they are within the size, it returns the reference. If they pass the index, it makes the, the array bigger. Easy, OK? And operator index essentially calls the at function. Same thing. And at the end, I delete everything. So now doing that, I have an array that I can resize to any size that I want, and it keeps going and runs perfectly for me. And I can work in any size that I want. So it resizes itself automatically. OK? Are we OK with this? Now I don't want an integer array anymore. I want a dynamic array for any type. I want to be able to have an array that I can use for any type. And I don't want to worry about the size of it. I want everything to work perfectly for me. How do I do that? Templates. What do I do? I'll come up here. First of all, it's not integer array anymore. It's going to be array of anything. So I'll change that one to array. And voila. Then I'm going to say template, type name. T. The name of the class right after the template is not changed. Integer pointer data, no. T pointer data. Unsigned integer size, yes. Size is size. It doesn't change. I don't need to change that. Array unsigned int size zero, no change. It's exactly the same. Size is size. Copy constructor is deleted, so I can't copy, but the array inside has to carry. It's not a constructor. 
This one will not get it. Operator equal is returning an array. I have to mention what type. Remember, all the, all the class names carry the signature except the constructor, destructor, and the name of the array immediately after. Size returns the size. I don't care. It has nothing to do with the type. Resize returns, get, receives a new size. It has nothing to do with the size. At returns the element, so it needs to be the type. But index, no. Operator index returns the reference of the element, so it needs to be the, the, the type, but the index is not. And the destructor won't change. Voila. I have the, the class created. Now, one by one, I'm going to go through these and do the exact same thing. So if I want to change the, the constructor, I'm going to have another one. The scope is over. A new one is created over here. The first array over here, it's not the name of the constructor. So that carries. The second one is the name of the constructor. I'm not going to touch it. When I'm creating new integers, it's not integer, it's new type that gets created, so that becomes new t. And it keeps going like that through everything that it has. One by one, you're going to go through them and make sure everything over there that is relative to what you have about the, uh, your integer template, your integer array should be converted exactly to cover all the types, and therefore, after all change, this is what you are going to get. Every single thing carries a template signature. But the logic is identical. Now, I can have array, but what type? Integer? So I'm going to put over here int. And there you go. Now I have an array of integers. Not only that, I can change it to any type. Do I have the any type over here? I want to see if I have an example for it. I don't have it, but use it with those cars and stuff, like create a, 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 a dynamic array of cars. OK? But again, you have to go through it and see what is happening over here with your array? What special things you need? When you look at it here, because you are creating new array of types, your type must have a default constructor. You are creating an array of it. If it doesn't have a default constructor, you can't. That's number one. What else do we have in here? It's the same, nothing over there. You can, you should, you are copying Element by element, which means assignment operator between your types should work. And that's it. So you, for this array, dynamic array, to work for everything, you need to have a default constructor and assignment operator. That's it. If your object has these things, it can work with my dynamic array. One more thing. You've heard that thing about iPhones, right? There is an app for that. Anything that they say, there is an app for that, right? C++ has a ginormous library of templates. The array that you see, we actually have it already. It's an array template. We have array templates, hash templates, sort template. You name it. You think of it, there is a template for it. It's called STL, Standard Template Library. They, we have a ginormous, huge uh, library of templates that are written so you don't have to write it again. All the data structures that you have, all the things that you have, you just need to know the documentation for the template. What needs to be covered over there, what you have to be worried about, and everything's going to work for you. Next semester is essentially all about standard template library. You're going to learn how to use that. That's why I said you need to know what templates are to appreciate what you're learning next semester. And that's just a brief view of what templates uh, are for with uh, 
with, with classes. But again, if I want the dynamic array to actually be an array for me, I have to actually create a, a header file and put everything that I have in here, everything, into that one. So I have to go like this, create over there, add, new item, call it array.h. Oh, if I can type it, array.h, and put everything in there. Of course, I'm going to put the safeguards and everything. And in here, instead of prg.cpp, now you can say include, include array.h, and use your array that way. OK? Include. OK? Again. Everything in a template, everything re related to your template must all be in a header file. There is no separate. A module for a template is only one header file, not a CPP file. That's a good question for final exam. If I have a, a template for a search, what should be the module for it? If you say search.cpp, search.h, it means you don't know what templates are. It's only one header file. Templates only exist in header files. Are we OK? Are we OK one? Are we OK two? I'll put, I'm going to work on the source code, clean it up, make sure everything works nicely and beautifully, and post them all on GitHub for you to browse and exercise. You have a quiz on Tuesday and Wednesday. Have a beautiful day, Italian.